Mindfulness means to keep something in mind. Like we're doing right now, we're keeping the breath in mind. But why are we keeping the breath in mind? There are basically three functions to mindfulness on the path. One is to remember to stay in the present moment, not, not let your attention shift off to the past or the future. The second is to remember to recognize what's coming up in the present moment, specifically what you're doing. To see what's skillful, what's unskillful. This means that, say, a thought arises in the mind. You can label it simply as a thought. Or if it's a specific hindrance, you can remember, okay, this is sensual desire, or this is ill will. And noting just that much allows you to step out of the thought for a bit. And that's when you apply the third function, is to remember what's effective in getting rid of unskillful thoughts and developing skillful ones in a place. This is the role of ardency. So you remember to be alert. You remember to recognize what's going on so that you can then deal with it in terms of right effort. That last function often gets forgotten. Many years back there was a monk who went into the hills of Burma and asked another monk there, where in the canon does the Buddha teach Vipassana? And the other monk replied, well, isn't everything in the Satipatthana Sutta? And that idea that that one sutta contains everything you didn't know about Vipassana or even about mindfulness has led to what's now the modern mindfulness movement, where the focus is totally on the first two functions of mindfulness, to be in the present moment and to recognize what's happening. But the sutta is not complete. That's not even a complete account of mindfulness. It gives the formula for mindfulness. You keep track of the body or feelings or mind or mental qualities in and of themselves. Ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. That form is repeated for the body and for feelings and for mind and mental qualities. And then the sutta addresses only one part of the formula. What does it mean to keep track of these things in and of themselves? It does that in a lot of detail. So much detail in the sutta is so long that people just naturally assume that it's complete. But the question of what ardency does is not addressed at all. That's the third function. That sometimes simply watching things come and go in the mind is enough to develop a sense of dispassion toward them. But it doesn't always work. And simply watching things coming and going is not enough to get the mind into concentration, which is what the purpose of mindfulness is. Even the city of Padana Sutta mentions this. You, when you're focusing on the breath, you start out just being aware of when it's long, when it's short, and then you consciously try to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, breathe out. And then from there you calm bodily fabrication, which the canon tells us in another place means get the mind into the fourth jhana. That doesn't happen on its own. Similarly with feelings, the sutta talks about feelings of the flesh, which are the feelings that arise willy-nilly at the senses. But then there are feelings not of the flesh. Those are things you have to consciously give rise to. The pain not of the flesh is the realization that there's work to be done, and you haven't reached the goal yet. It's a painful thought, but the Buddha actually recommends developing it, better than sitting around just being upset at things in the world. He says, try to develop a sense of wanting to attain a goal and being willing to put up with the pain of that want, because that's your motivation. Then there's the pleasure not of the flesh, which is the sense of ease and well-being that comes when you get the mind into right concentration. So even the sutta hints at these other, other levels that need to be done, that they're not just going to happen on their own. Because that's one of the functions of mindfulness that the Buddha calls as a governing principle. In other words, it's watching over the mind. 
and it's to give rise to anything unskillful that's not there in the mind, and then once it's there, it's to maintain it, to make sure it doesn't fall away. So it's good to think about this third function of mindfulness, because it's the one that tends to get forgotten, but it's also the most important. There are times when you have to consciously try to get past, a, say, a sensual desire or feelings of ill will, and simply noticing that they're there is not going to be enough to get rid of them. This is where the Buddha's analysis of how you deal with things that are taking over the mind comes in. There are five steps. First, did you look for the origination? What causes that state to come? What sparks it? Be aware of the fact that something has been sparked in the mind. Don't wait until it becomes full-blown. And then notice when it passes away. A lot of these thoughts come and go, come and go, come and go. When they come, they stir up some hormones, and then the thought is gone. But the hormones are still stirred up. You're still having the physical symptoms, say, of lust, or the physical symptoms of anger or fear or guilt. And then because the physical symptoms are there, you figure, well, the, the feeling must still be there, that thought must still be there, and you dig up the thought again. So it's good to notice when the thought goes. And realize it is. It comes and goes in short periods. And then it'll stop for a while, and then it'll start up again. And look for the times when you're starting it up again. That way it begins to seem less monolithic. And you also begin to realize why you begin to go for it, what sparks it. Because that relates to the third step, which just looked for the allure. Say when sensual desire arises, and desire for a particular kind of food, you ask yourself, why am I going for it? What's the pull? And in some cases, it's because the body actually needs that kind of food. In other cases, it has to do with other things, some of the associations we have with food. They talk about comfort food. I've never particularly found meatloaf to be comfortable. But there are associations you have with it, and your mother made it back when you were young. And so there are associations that go with that. There are other kinds of food where the associations have more to do with status, or with something exotic. This is why we have that reflection on why we eat, just for the maintenance of the body. Make sure you don't get ill, and you have the strength to practice. That's all you need. Food doesn't have to be fancier than that. So look for the allure. Sometimes it actually makes sense in the case. In that case, it's not really defilement. But other times, it's something pretty strange. And yet, we, the problem is we tend to hide it from ourselves. We don't see it, or we're embarrassed about it, or part of the mind is embarrassed, so it hides it from the rest of the mind. So often, we don't know exactly why we go for something. This can be sensual desire for ill will, worries about things. Sometimes you worry about things because you feel good, you feel responsible because you're worrying. But the worrying doesn't really accomplish anything. This comes particularly clear at death. One of the things the Buddha says is someone is dying, make sure they're not worried about the people they're leaving behind. Because after all, at that point, there's really nothing they can do for those other people. And the worrying just drags them down. But there's that sense of obligation sometimes. The people you're responsible for, you feel, how can I leave these people? Well, we've been leaving one another for who knows how long. This is where the master narrative of Buddhism is good, the narrative of many, many lifetimes. Put the narrative of your life in the context of that larger master narrative and see how it looks in that perspective. Our lives have intertwined who knows how many times, and then they've separated again and again. 
come back again, separate it again. And the roles get switched. And if you identify too strongly with a particular role, you're going to suffer when you no longer have that role. So look for the allure, and then look at it in terms of that master narrative. Is going for this particular defilement really worth it in terms of the consequences it's going to have? And does it make sense in terms of that larger narrative? This is when you get to the fourth step, which is to see the drawbacks. Holding on to that particular kind of thought, where does it lead you? Where does it go? And what does it do to other people? So much of our desire for happiness requires laying claim to things. And of course, other people are going to lay claim. And when everything is laid claim to, where are you going to find an innocent happiness? You've got to push other people out of the way, like that vision the Buddha had of the fish in the stream, pushing one another out of the way to get that last gulp of water before they all die. So they get the cup of water, but they die anyhow, and then because they cause harm to another, there's karma that goes with that. That's the way it is in the world. It's not just fish, it's the way human beings live. So when a thought comes up in the mind that pulls you away from the practice, that pulls you away from concentration, you can tell yourself, do I want to be like a fish, laying claim to something that I can't even hold on to for very long? Or can I come back and find some well-being inside? my sense of the body as I feel from within, my sense of my mind as I sense it from within. Because that's something that nobody else can lay claim to, nobody else can even know it. That's your territory entirely. So when you think in these ways, you can develop a sense of dispassion, because you realize there's something better that comes when you let go. That's an important principle in the Buddhist teachings. You don't let go simply saying, well, everything is really bad, so I might as well not try. There is something good in life. There's a whole area inside your body, inside your awareness, that you can straighten out. And in straightening it out, you can find a genuine happiness. So that's why we let go. We let go out, dis <clears throat> out of dispassion, and the dispassion comes from growing up. Because this is a lot of what our growth in the practice is, is we're growing up, we're maturing. We admit the consequences of our actions, and then we try to find a way that makes our actions less harmful to others, less harmful to ourselves. And we realize that we can take responsibility for ourselves. So it's in these ways that mindfulness performs that third function, which is helping us remember how do you let go of things that are harmful, how do you develop things that are skillful. And then you remember this from things that you've heard, but you also remember it even more, more clearly from things you've done and you found that you got good results. So when you're practicing mindfulness, make sure that it's complete. You remember to stay in the present moment, anchored in one of the four frames of reference. You remember to recognize things that are coming up in the mind, and learn how to label them. This is skillful, this is unskillful. That's usually not the first thought that comes to us, of course. Lust comes into the mind, anger comes into the mind, we just tend to go for it. But if you can stop for a bit and say, hey, well, this is a hindrance, that enables you to move on to the third function, is to remind yourself, well, this is what you do with something that's a hindrance. You learn how to let go. If there's something that leads to concentration, more mindfulness, a sense of fullness inside, a sense of ease inside, can you develop that? You remember to develop that. And that way the Buddhist teachings on mindfulness achieve their purpose which is to give the mind a good place inside, where it can settle down, have a sense of well-being that doesn't have to depend on anybody else. 
and puts the mind in a good position where it can see even more clearly where its attachments are and how it can let go. So it's good that people are trying to be alert to the present moment and trying to recognize what's going on. But it's even better when they move on to the third step and learn how to use that knowledge, use that awareness to find something really skillful inside. That's how the Buddha characterized his own quest, the quest for what was skillful. And this is what he found. He found that from the concentration you can develop the mind in a way that leads to a happiness that goes even deeper, that goes beyond the concentration. So check inside yourself, develop the qualities that the Buddha talked about, and see if it leads to the same result.